Good afternoon. Welcome, 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 everyone. We are so happy to see so many people in the building today. So welcome, welcome. Um, so many of you know, as a result of a referendum, um, the Greenbelt Reparations Commission was established in 2022. And so we have many representatives of the Greenbelt Reparations Commission here. We also have uh, representation from the city council as well as our mayor. So before I go into an introduction of the commission members, I want to make sure that we introduce uh, Mayor Jordan and make sure that he has some welcome remarks for us. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here to Greenbelt and to the Greenbelt Library. Uh, you know, thanks for uh, hosting us here, this program here, and all the great programs that you do year-round, as well as Black History Month. On behalf of the Greenbelt City Council, we bring our greetings. Council Member Ginny Pompey is here. Former Council Members uh, Hurling and Jay uh, Davis. <laughs> <laughs> And most of all, you know, I want to I want to thank uh, Megan Searing Young for her work as a staff liaison, sort of with the Reparations Commission. And this commission was impaneled about a year and a half ago uh, as a result of, of the passion of many individuals. And there was a, a ballot question, so uh, the panel's been working really, really hard for more than a year. So it's just really, really fitting and uh, interesting to, to be able to sit and uh, dialogue a little bit about uh, African American history, Greenbelt, and the intersection of so many things. So on behalf of the Greenbelt City Council, uh, thank you for coming out to, uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Mayor. So we have, it's a 21 member commission, I, su I should mention, um, and we have a great, a great number of commission members here, so I'd ask them all to stand. <laughs> Thank you so much. So as you know, this program is really um, for us to just dig in deeper into the black history of uh, Greenbelt, Prince George's County. We are really happy to have some of our speakers here today. Um, a bit later in the program, we are going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing over the past year. We started meeting last year around this time, so we will give you an update of where we are and what we're doing. Um, we'll also do a quick warm-up, and I'll pass it over to Denise to do that. And then we'll have our two speakers um, to provide us with some history uh, about Greenbelt and Prince George's County. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Denise for a little exercise. Okay, this is called a pear share. You guys heard of that before? Yes, one person, okay. <laughs> so I want you to think about an African-American person or a person of African descent who inspires you. To be someone famous or someone you know personally. Now turn to a person next to you and tell them who that person is and why they inspire you. <laughs> and let the other person share their inspiration with you. So you'll each have one minute to do this starting now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, and we do uh, that pair and share because we like to, to ground this work um, in community and relationships. And so we always like to start with a little um, pair and share like that. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, uh, who I have to read from this because they're, uh, this person has an amazing amount of things they've accomplished. Um, so Arturo Miss Jackson is the um, historic site manager at Ridgely Rosenwald School in Capitol Heights, Maryland, and a, and a historian in the Black History Program at the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Association. 
uh, which operates out of Abraham Hall, a historic African-American um, benevolent lodge located in Beltsville. The Black History Program at N MNCPPC manages three historic African-American sites in Prince George's County. They also provide year-round programming related to African-American history. Before joining the Black History Program, she served as a graduate assistant at the Edward H. Knapp Center for Delmarva History and Culture at Salisbury University. She's an alumna of Salisbury University where she uh, obtained her BA um, in History in 2014 and an MA in Arts degree in History in 2016. She specialized in Gender Studies, 20th Century U.S. Historian and African American History. In 2019, uh, Arturo was named a 40 under 40 by the Prince George's County Social Innovation Fund. She's uh, also the historian for the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, a 220-year-old congregation. She is a native of Prince George's County and a proud graduate of Largo High School. So, um, please welcome Ms. Victoria So nice to see you all. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Megan, um, in the city of Greenbelt. It is an honor to be here. I'm a native Prince Georgian, so Greenbelt has always been a part of my life. Um, again, I work for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Department of Parks and Recreation, Prince George's County. We kind of have to say that. Uh, <laughs> and um, I have the esteemed pleasure of serving in the Black History Program and being the site manager of the historic Ridgely Rosenwald Schoolhouse in Capitol Heights. So um, this presentation is interesting. Uh, it's a combination of a couple of presentations that I've done throughout the county, um, which really highlights the African American history and African American experience um, in Prince George's County, um, a few other places. And so hopefully you, you know some places, things will resonate with you. I'm a really fun person, so you can laugh and interact and all that stuff. <laughs> I don't like stuffy history presentations, I promise. So uh, I just want to start off, um, as you all know, I focus in African American history. And so looking at slavery in Maryland, um, antebellum Maryland, uh, the census records, as you can see, uh, there was a high number of enslaved women in our state, um, as well as men. Um, Prince George's County had the highest number of enslaved people. Um, we had a lot of plantations in our county. Um, I like to tell people, if you live in any part of Prince George's County, you probably live on a former site of enslavement. Um, and we, of course, um, as you know, through the Civil War, although we fought on the side of the Union, uh, people in Maryland remained enslaved until November 1st, 1864, uh, when we end slavery in Maryland through um, an act of the amendment to the state of Maryland's Constitution. Um, and at the end of the Civil War, Maryland has probably one of the highest free blacks and black population, um, but things drastically change afterwards. I think people wanted to see new places and visit new spots and move on. Um, so again, slavery in Prince George's County. Our cash crop here was tobacco. Um, tobacco is an interesting crop if you know anything about it. It is harsh on the soil. Um, and so when people, when the, you know, Planters arrive and they see this amazing soil that can grow this lovely tobacco that people over in England and Europe love. Um, they take advantage of the soil and the growth that we have. And so um, what they don't know is that tobacco does not last long. It, it destroys the earth. Um, it is a hard crop to grow. It's a hard crop to maintain. And you might get seven good seasons of planting. Um, which is interesting, right? So they're bringing in tons of enslaved people um, to Prince George's County to grow this crop and, and, and throughout Southern Maryland, not just Prince George's County, but not realizing that, hey, this land will not hold this crop for much longer. So around, I think like 1840, you see um, a shift where people are being sold south um, and sold to other places. Um, if you know anything about the Georgetown too, Five, I believe, uh, they were sold by the Jesuits. Um, that is one instance where we see people being sold south, but there were other instances um, in our county and in our region because they couldn't maintain these plantations um, because the tobacco was not growing. 
Just so you guys can see, uh, these are three maps, uh, all of Prince George's County. Started in 1696, around the time of our founding, you see maybe seven, eight plantations in Prince George's County. Uh, if you go to 1731 to 1790, you see a couple more pop up, but between 1791 and 1864, you see a considerable amount of plantations in Prince George's County. That's why when I say, if you live in this county, you probably live on the site of former enslavement. Um, they were everywhere. There was no place that was unscathed um, and did not have some ties to plantation um, life. So, like I said, on November 1st, 1864, Maryland officially ends slavery here in the state um, and begins the process of, of emancipation um, and freeing the people who are currently enslaved. Now that is not to say that people did not self-emancipate, um, that people did not take things into their own hands. Some of my favorite narratives of residents of Prince George's County are the ones who fought back, the ones who ran, the ones who, uh, um, you know, did not take it sitting down. So there there were people who ran away. We have records um, through William Steele's uh, documentation of people coming through Philadelphia who were enslaved in Prince George's County. So they were moving northward. We know that they got, we have records that suggest that people got as far as Niagara and possibly crossed over to the Canadian border. Um, and right now, some of our historic sites in MNCPPC are doing research to see what happens once they cross into Canada. But Reconstruction is an interesting time. So because we fought on the side of the Union, but continue to have enslaved people here um, in the state of Maryland, we did not get the benefits of the Reconstruction Era organizations. So you think about the Freedmen's Bureau and all those things, and you, oftentimes when you say like history, you hear, oh, the Freedmen's Bureau came in and they created a school or they built a hospital. Well, that was for places that continued to have slavery or did not fight on the side of the Union. But because we were a little bit more complex and complicated, um, we didn't really get those benefits here. And so there are instances of the Freedmen's Bureau helping out in Prince George's County, but most of those instances are people doing the fundraising themselves and then seeking support from the Freedmen's Bureau. On the bottom half of the screen, you will see Abraham Hall. Has anyone ever been to Abraham Hall? Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, so Abraham Hall was built in 1889. Uh, it was the home of the sons and daughters of Abraham, uh, which was an African-American benevolent society. Uh, they were likely formerly enslaved people who supported the Merkirk Ironworks. We know that they actually, the communities founded from workers from the Merkirk Ironworks, but they initially probably descended from people who were enslaved there. Uh, so this building is a benevolent society. It's two stories. Uh, it has two rooms. It used to be my office. And there's no doors, uh, which is a lot of fun when we try to get work done. And in this picture, we didn't even have curtains, so now we have curtains. But um, this is an example of the Freedmen Bureau's interaction with uh, residents of Prince George's County. So this building is established. Uh, they start, you know, meeting here. The Benevolent Society is created to support the community of Merkirk, so the African Americans there. It's to support people if they get hurt at work in the ironworks, but also if someone in your family should pass away, you could go to the lodge and they would assist you with um, benevolent aid or just helping out. But it also served as a schoolhouse. And so this is where the Freedmen's Bureau comes into play. The guy who owned the Merkirk Ironworks was the Coffin family. And so he knew he had all these formerly enslaved people and he needed they needed education. And so he reaches out to the Freedmen's Bureau, gets some resources, but eventually they outgrow the small space that was given. And so from, I believe, like 1880 to, um, 19, no, from 1900, eventually they would move into this building. And so um, for about 40 years, they uh, were students from in the Merkur community were educated in this building. And they had initially support from the Freedmen's Bureau, but when the Freedmen's Bureau is defunded, um, they continue on to educate them through the community. And so if you've ever been in that part of Prince George's County, uh, you know that there is a VFW at the top of the hill from Abraham Hall, and that would eventually become, a, was a Rosenwald School at first. So the students moved from Abraham Hall to the school at the top of the hill. I also highlight other African American families in here. So you see some of the Ridgely family, a family that was established. We are trying to continue to trace 
uh, their history in Prince George's County. We know that they would have had some type of relationship with Zachariah Berry's family. Um, we haven't been able to substantially prove that they were enslaved on Zach Berry's plantation, but we know that they were working and supporting that effort. Um, but they buy land as soon as they can, as soon as they are able to. They, this family seeks to buy out land. They buy 52 acres in Capitol Heights, Maryland, um, which is a large amount of land. And they begin to farm it and grow it and sell and just really change the course of their lives. And they would go on to establish a church, um, a school, and they continue to have a footprint. And so if you know where, does anyone know where Morgan Boulevard Metro Station is? Yes. Okay, so Morgan Boulevard Metro Station sits on the part of the 52 acres that they purchased. They sold that land to Metro when the station was created. Um, and when slavery ends in first service kind a lot of people leave. They, I wouldn't want to stay, and I could completely understand why they left. Um, but they go into D.C., they go into other suburbs and other places. Um, but there are a few people who stay, a few communities that stay. And so you'll see communities like Merkirk and Ridgely um, and North Brentwood, which are enclaves, although North Brentwood was, was founded in the 20th century, are enclaves of descendants of formerly enslaved people. I wish I could say things got better, but they did not um, in French George's County. Just like anywhere else across the United States, racism and segregation would persist and continue to grow um, and really rear its ugly head in French George's County it was no different. I recently gave a relative who's moving to this area a tour of the county and the way that I described Prince George's County to him so that he could understand because he sees this lovely black majority in this county and you know we have African American politicians and he's like has this been going on for forever and I said well Maryland sometimes is the Mississippi of the north um, <laughs> because that's the reality is that um, although we are a northern technically not northern, but people consider us the north, we have a lot of southern tendencies. And segregation and racism was one that we picked up, unfortunately. Um, I love to show this ad. It's from the Washington Times, I believe around 1901. Um, I just referenced Morgan Boulevard, which is in the Capitol Heights area. You see uh, this whites only ad for residents moving into Capitol Heights, Maryland, um, that they promise that there will be no racial mixing um, in this community. And today, Capitol Heights is majority African American. So it shows you kind of the intentions. And people were coming out of DC. They were promising you would be away from these people. You don't have to worry. You can move out into the suburb area and live without racial tensions. Um, also, communities are established. Uh, Prince George's County has five African American historic African-American communities, one of them being Lakeland, which is in the College Park area, which is doing similar work to you guys are doing with reparations and restorative justice. Um, so that is one of them, North Brentwood, uh, Glen Arden, Eagle Harbor, but these are all places where African-American communities are established in Prince George's County, and they not only establish communities, they establish legislative and government bodies, so they have, you know, mayors, and they have town meetings, and they really create this space that um, they can live in and that they are proud of. Um, if you meet anyone who's a Lakelander, you know, they will tell you about the amazing community that Lakeland was. If you meet someone from historic North Brentwood, they will tell you about it. Make sure you go visit Eagle Harbor. It is the cutest little beach town in Prince George's County, and beaches in Prince George's County are words that are often not mixed together. <laughs> but it's really, really adorable. Um, so it would begin here. I pulled this, uh, this is a housing covenant. Not only did they advertise for restrictions, it was written into the covenants of the neighborhoods. This is for the city of Chevrolet. And I did a project with the city of Chevrolet a couple years ago. And um, they, when we started the project, they said, oh, well, we didn't have any documents that suggested redlining and racial housing covenants. And I was able to find this. Um, and this is what was said, no person of any race other than Caucasian race shall use or occupy any building or any lot except that that is a covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of different race domicile with an owner or tenant. Um, this was standard language for a lot of our communities. Um, I know that Greenbelt did not initially welcome African Americans, and it would be to the 1960s that African Americans could move into this community. So it is not a mark of shame, it's a mark of honesty and truth um, in the work that we do that 
we have been able to overcome this. We have not allowed these things to hold us back, but I think it's an important part of our past that we have to be honest about and to call out. This is probably like my favorite part of Prince George's County history. That's weird, but I am a second generation Prince Georgian and a sixth generation Marylander. And so my mom uh, is, she grew up in Prince George's County and when she started here, uh, she went to segregated public schools. And I have spent a lot of time listening to her, doing an oral history with her, and documenting her story because our busing story is very unique. Um, when Prince George's County, well, when the state of Maryland formalizes school systems, they decide that you know each county should have schools, and they provide, they determine how they'll be set up. And so Prince George's County decides we'll have a black school system and we'll have a white school system, and so they are separate, um, completely separate. They do not early on. Um, from about the 1880s to about 1950 something, they operate separately. They have their own superintendents. Has anyone ever heard the name Doswell E. Brooks? Ring a bell? Okay, well he was the first African American superintendent of the African American schools and he worked diligently to make sure that students had access. Um, we had 27 rolls and more schools in Prince George's County, which is a high number for a small state. Maryland only had 154. and. That is a sign that one, the community was active. So I love, I work at a Rosenwald school, but I love pointing out that everywhere you see a Rosenwald school is an African American community that's striving to educate their children. Um, but Doswell E. Brooks had a lot to do with that work, and so he worked diligently to you know, make sure that the students have access. Uh, we have records of him buying a school bus, fundraising to get them a school bus, because the only way that they would be able to get to school was via walking. So up until about the time that Brown versus Board of Education comes down from the Supreme Court, Prince George's County operates two separate school systems. And if you know anything about Brown, it says with all deliberate speed, you know, do this right away, this is not okay. And what Prince George's County decides to do is say, we'll keep them separate and put them under one envelope. We'll, you know, we'll have one governing body, but we'll have separate, we'll continue to operate in separate schools. Well, that was a fatal mistake because that was failure to abide by the law, failure to abide by what the Supreme Court had said and suggested. And so for about 20 years from, you know, the passing of Brown until 1970, Prince George's County would just continue on and do what they wanted. And a couple of parents, a man named Sylvester Vaughn, um, got together and they filed a class action lawsuit against the Prince George's County Public Schools, um, saying that they had failed to integrate and failed to desegregate schools and it was intentional. You know, it starts in 1970. In 1972, the courts rule, and it comes down that you all must integrate. Like, you have to do this. And so, in conversations with my mother, she said they went home for Christmas break, attending their all-black school. And when they came back in the new year, they were sent to schools across the county. Um, and so, the solution in Prince George's County was not to say, you know, we need to integrate our communities. They suggested busing. And the best way to describe Prince George's County busing is imagine splitting a school in half, keeping one group of kids there, and then sending another group across the county to go to school. It worked, but I don't know if it was effective. Uh, if you ask anyone uh, who went through that, they would tell you probably not. Uh, that it destroyed community bonds, it created them versus us, and not just them versus us in terms of black and white, but if you were the ones who had to go, you had to go to school with the black kids. If you were the black kid who had to go to school with the white student, you have to go to school with them, you think you're better than them. So it creates this communal divide when they had a lot of autonomy in this. Um, busing begins in 1972 and does not end until the year 2002 um, in Prince George's County, which is interesting. So my mother began it and I was in seventh grade when it ended um, as a Prince George's County Public School student. Of course, um, there would be mass exodus. Uh, people left. They moved out of Prince George's County. They, they busing, although it continued on for about 40 years, um, the reason why it stopped basically was because there was no integration actually happening. They were just busing kids from the north part of the county to the southern part or different places. They were not integrating, so they began to work to end that in 2002 so when it officially comes to a close. But I think it's an interesting history that we don't talk about enough, um, that there's a generation of people who experienced this who have not had the opportunity to speak and to tell their story. So it's some of the work that we're doing over at MCPPC for the Black History Program. 
I talk about my mommy, and that's her in that picture in the bottom row. Um, she's not here today, but I always like to include her in my presentations when I can. Uh, my family uh, was one of the families who came to Prince George's County uh, for better opportunities. My family, my mother's family, originates in Virginia. My grandparents were college educated. They knew that they wouldn't be able to occupy their professions in rural Virginia, so they moved to Maryland or to DC first, um, and they started their family. And, you know, I had my mom, my aunt, and my uncle, and then uh, they saw opportunity in Prince George's County. And so we talk about red lighting, but we should also talk about the white flight and the scare tactics that realtors use to one, sell homes in Prince George's County, but to also frighten both black and white people. Um, there are newspaper articles that we found that suggest what people are telling, realtors are telling the white people in the community, hey, five black families moved in today, five more are coming tomorrow, you need to go now. And then selling the homes to these African American families at overpriced rates. There are a lot of communities, if you look in the inner beltway, uh, that support this concept. My mother, my family moved to Palmer Park, um, and my grandparents thought it was Utopia. Uh, they could get an affordable home, they could raise their babies there, they would have good schools, and they were moving out to the suburbs, so they were really moving on up. And what I like to show is this is my mother sitting in her living room in Palmer Park, uh, probably the late 1960s. And then this is a photo that I actually found here in the Prince Church Historical Society. Uh, it's the same neighborhood, maybe 10 years prior to that. And you see the difference of like how people moved in and out. And so a lot of it has to do with busing, but one of the things that I think is really unique to our Prince George's County story is that, you know, if you look at the 1970 census, Prince George's County is majority white. Uh, there is a small population of black people. They're moving in, yes, but they there's not a, not a lot of them. You go to the 1980 census and it almost flips. Um, in 10 years, our population changed drastically. Uh, although, the tactics which were used, um, you know, speculation and fear mongering um, to get people to move in and out of the county, it would allow for this black majority to begin. You see African Americans taking office as early as 1982 in Prince George's County. Not that they had not sought positions earlier, like in the late 1970s, we see people joining the school board, but not just local positions, state positions. Christine Jones, I believe, runs for state delegate in 1982. And her family moved from the district um, into Prince George's County as well. And like I said earlier, what helped do this was affordable housing um, that people could afford, you know, if you had meager income or you were just trying to get it together, you could afford to move into Prince George's County. This the little article shows, you know, the, the, the decline of the white population and the growth of the black population. We have a lot of garden style apartments in Prince George's County and that gave people who maybe couldn't afford it to buy a home the opportunity to at least settle in the county. And so these are two factors that I believe cause you know, the increase of population and what will become the rise of the black majority. So uh, that is one of the things that we have studied over the last couple of years in uh, my office is how did this come to be? Um, and so you see Judge Alex Williams, who is a Prince George's County resident who goes and seeks office in the, one of the highest courts. He is a federal judge. He's a trailblazer. I've met him before. And you also see communities being established. Um, you see, you know, large sub-developments, Woodmore, um, all these places coming up and African American communities are moving in, or African Americans are moving into these communities and not only just moving in, they are creating neighborhoods, creating just culture and experience. And so um, all those things kind of lead to this. And so Megan asked me to pull from a presentation I did um, for the city of Laurel. And so I did some research because I'm a historian, that's what I do my spare time. <laughs> and what I found out was that um, initially when Greenbelt is being planned, that there was a plan to have an African American section and it would have been Rossville. And I really was diving in and I was like, I wanna know more, I wanna know more. Well, I spent a lot of time in Rossville because it is the community of Merkirk. It is where Abraham Hall was. And so um, it's on the top side of the USDA off of Merkirk Road. And so um, I wanted to share, I, of course, the plans were, you know, mixed 
early on in the development of Greenbelt, but what this community was, who these people were, and maybe give some clues as to why this area might have been selected. So this is a presentation I did called Memories from Rare Cargo. And so towns have lots of interesting names, right? So if you've ever, like I said, if you've ever been to Abraham Hall, it's technically in Beltsville, but it's literally South Laurel. It has at least eight or nine names. So these are the names of that community. It was once called Swamp Poodle, Merkirk, Harrotsville, Bacontown's not too far away. The Grove and Laurel is a part of it. It's it's just a whole bunch of names. But all these names have histories and meanings. So I'll share a little bit about them. Richard Snowden was a planter. Um, he came to the U.S. as an indentured servant. Um, he was one of the largest land owners in this part of Maryland. He not only owned land in Prince George's County, he would own land in Howard County and Anne Arundel County and throughout. Um, it was not just limited to Prince George's County. I did an um, analysis. I think he had over 30,000 acres of land. That's pretty, bigger than the city of Laurel. Um, that's huge. Uh, he owned a lot of land and he quickly discovered that there was a natural resource in the earth that could make him money once he, be, once he ended his indenture servitude and that was iron. Um, and so he began to set up iron ores and refractories throughout the northern Prince George's County section. If you've ever been to Montpelier Mansion, that is where his family lived, but also Snow Hill. There's a site at the nearby here that his family lived on as well. Um, so they had lots of plantations and lots of um, enslaved people working for them. But what they did do was the ones who we know lived close to their home, Montpelier, um, those enslaved people were particularly going into the earth and pulling iron out. Um, if you don't know anything about that, that is a litigious and hard task. I would never wish that upon anyone. Like, I think it is very difficult work. Um, but these people who came here, these enslaved people who arrived here, um, we believe were actually selected from a particular part of Africa because of their ability to dig and to mine um, natural resources from the earth. And so they go in and they start pulling out ore, and we have proof of you know, pieces of iron from Richard Snowden's, or from, you know, ironry going all the way to England. We've actually had pieces sent back to us with our marks on them. So we know that the Patuxent Iron Work was producing a lot of iron and just really helping build the infrastructure of not just the United States, but the modern world. Um, and it was done on the backs of enslaved people. I would like to add also, does anyone know our state dinosaur? <laughs> it's the Astrodon Johnstonai. Um, <laughs> fun fact, I, I know that too. Uh, but <laughs> interestingly, how the Astrodon Johnstonai came to be and how we learned that we had dinosaurs in Prince George's County in the state of Maryland was due to enslaved labor. When they were digging in the iron ores, they were finding these large bones. Um, and they would toss them to the side and, you know, you know just a bone, whatever, no big deal. Um, and eventually, um, the Protection Iron Ironworks changes hands, but um, when the Coffin family kind of takes ownership of it, they reach out to the new institution called the Smithsonian, and they share with them, hey, we have these large animal bones. Can you come look at them? And they come out and they look and they say, that's a dinosaur. You all have found a dinosaur. And so what we learned is that the true paleontologist that helped us discover the Ashton Johnson I was likely the enslaved workers. I mean, we know that they were pulling them out and throwing them to the side, um, but they don't get the credit that they deserve for actually discovering our state dinosaur. Um, I talk about that uh, these people were skilled and they were smart. I don't want anyone to ever think that um, enslaved people did not have autonomy or desire or wishes. Um, this is a runaway ad um, for the Snowden family. Um, someone has run um, north and they are seeking to find them. Um, so like I talked about people who you know self-liberated, it was happening not only um, you know in the tobacco fields, but it was happening everywhere. They wanted to get away from this. They did not want to work in these spaces. We have African Americans in Merkirk who serve not only in 
they actually have served in every, I believe, U.S. conflict that we've ever had from revolutionary force. So we can trace people who were enslaved with the Snowden family on Fort, and they served in every um, conflict. And so uh, this is a veteran, and he's actually buried um, in the cemetery if you've ever gone to Queens Chapel United Methodist Church, which sits on Mercury Road as well. Um, there, it's a historic cemetery, and um, the family documents, you know, the different people who were there. So they, one, were freeing themselves, you know, on their own, but they also found freedom and just liberation through serving our country, which is an interesting perspective, a country that maybe didn't always show kindness to them, they still fought on its behalf. And so this is the plat of land, which would have been Rossville. Um, today, we only have two original structures that still remain, Abraham Hall, and there's a home about uh, one-tenth of a mile away from us that is another original structure. But they, when they purchased this land, so uh, Rossville is named after the Ross family, um, and you can see them at the top of the list, but they are purchasing plots and they subdivide. And so some of these subdivided plots actually are still standing. So Abraham Hall was one of them, the home that is still standing. Um, but they really established community. Um, they want more for themselves. The Coffin family would have provided homes for them. So you see in the bottom half of the picture, the homes that were given to them for the families who worked in the iron ores. Um, I don't like to refer to it as sharecropping, but if you imagine the impacts and relationship of sharecropping, so tenant leasing, right? You work for us, we let you live on our property, you get a small or nominal portion of what you produce, and you can buy from the stores that we have and those types of things. So not sharecropping in the brutal sense like we think of Alabama, Mississippi, but similar to that, this is what's going on. And so these families are choosing to not be subjected to those things. They're saying, we're going to start our own community, we're going to move out, we're going to do our own thing. And so that would be the footprints of Rossville. Their faith is important. Um, what I've learned in Prince George's County, if you go to an African American community, there are three things you should look for. A school, a church, and a benevolent society. Those are indicative of community um, because it addresses the three you know, biggest needs, um, education, community and support, and then faith. Um, and so the Queen's Chapel United Methodist Church is established around, you know, a little bit before 1890 or 1880. It's the first structure built in Rossville. Uh, it still stands today, not this building, this is the old church, but um, a derivative of it still stands. And there are families who are part of the founding congregation that still worship there today. Um, like I said, they have a historic cemetery that's nearby, and you can find in people um, and just different things if you've ever gone there they have these beautiful yucca plants that are planted on some of the graves and that you know is a West African tradition to kind of give life to those who are deceased and so we actually found clues in that cemetery for that fidelity like I said establishing um, not only a school or a church but also this benevolent society um, what I have learned in my seven years of working for the black history program is that these people were very proud that they took this very seriously that it was not just a social club that this was a way for uplift this was a way to make a change in their lives and as you see they're decorated in their traditional Masonic outfits um, and they're at Abraham Hall for a meeting so what we learned in our research is that you actually can't join this benevolent lodge. You have to be born in. Um, so the members who are a part, who the last members who are a part of it, um, actually descend from the original founders. Um, you couldn't just be a person walking off the street and say, I want to become a member of your lodge. No, you have to be related to them. Um, they had a secret knock. Uh, they had, we've seen people come in and say, yeah, you couldn't go upstairs. Everybody could be downstairs, but only if you knew the secret knock could you go upstairs. And they showed us where the door was. So they took their, their work seriously. I love this image too. And I love finding different images of just early African-American life in Prince George's County. And these are people who are working in the Merkirk Ironworks. I always challenge people to pick one person in the picture and just imagine what they're saying. What are they thinking? What is their day like? What have they done? Um, what I can tell you is that they worked hard and they believed in family um, and community. Um, and so I, I always think that that is a sign of fortitude, just to continue to build a better life for your family and for your community.
like I said earlier, education was a big part of it. This is one of the earliest classes. These are students standing outside of uh, Abraham Hall. Um, and you can tell they're not just one grade. The grades range. The, you have older children and younger children. But they are, again, if you look at their eyes and their faces, serious about what they're learning and serious about this development um, that's happening in their community. I try to find like people who are my heroes. And so like, I'm a millennial. Fun fact, um, and most people would think like Beyonce is my idol. She's not, she really isn't. She's an awesome woman, but not my idol. I have fallen in love with people like Hester V. King, um, who was an African-American woman um, born in Culpeper, Virginia, but her family moves to this area, uh, and her family settles in Merkirk. She established the Prince George's County NAACP chapter. There's an annual luncheon called the Hester V. King Luncheon, and most people do not know who Hester V. King is. This woman was not afraid of anything or anyone. Um, people might not imagine it, but the Ku Klux Klan was very active in Prince George's County. Uh, very prevalent, very active, and very aggressive. She had, I believe, three crosses burned on her front lawn in her time as NAACP president. She fought for integration in 1953, before Brown, before our county said, we're gonna try to do something. She was fighting for these things. She was a force to be reckoned with, and she was the voice of not only the Merkur community, but the African-American community in Prince George's County. We find articles of people saying, we have to talk to Hester V. King if we want the black community to go along with this plan that we have. Um, she was instrumental in this. She made sure that all of her children, so she and her husband are standing there, but all the people around her are her children. Uh, to my, I guess, left, uh, the young man who's on the far edge, standing up, kind of looking towards that, that is Arthur King. He was the first African-American elected to uh, the House of Delegates from Prince George's County. Um, and he represented Mount Rainier, and that was her son. Mrs. King's story is somewhat tragic. Like I said, she was a freedom fighter. Uh, she fought for many different things, um, but her life would end probably too soon. Um, she was actually murdered by her husband. Um, we believe it, was, they say it's an accident, but there have been speculation and allegations that it wasn't. Um, he had, they had just had a fight about her service to the community and him asking her to step back. Um, and to remove herself from this work. And he said that he thought an intruder was in the house and the refrigerator door was open and he didn't know who it was and he shot. And so she is murdered in I believe like 62 or 63. Some people believe that her husband was pressured to do it by forces you know, outside of their home um, to quiet her because she would not be quiet, she would not be kept still. She had a passion for this. like. To start, to be a woman and start your own NAACP chapter in Prince George's County prior to 1970, you're a bad woman. Like, you all snaps to her. Um, and then finally is the community. Um, like I said earlier, there were multiple benevolent societies, not just in Merkert, but throughout. Um, this is a flag of the Lanesburg Burial Association. And I highlight this because life is important, but how we honor our dead is important as well. And as a historian, it is very hard to identify where enslaved people are buried and tell people, people come to us asking, well, do you know where their burial ground is? Are there markers? How do you tell? And oftentimes we don't have an answer for them. Um, oftentimes it's, we, we don't know. Uh, but what I do know is that it was important to African American people because they found organizations like the Bladensburg Burial Association and they sell plots um, in their community. They buy land and they make sure that there's a special place for their loved ones to be buried. But also these organizations would continue to support these families after their loved one had passed on. And so we had a community member who had a membership to this organization. Um, the cemetery was actually moved and somewhat destroyed by the Baltimore Washington Parkway. But African Americans took not only life seriously, but the afterlife as well. And so these are what remains in Merkirk um, and what would have remained in Rossville. Uh, like I said, Abraham Hall, um, the family home, that, that stuccoed house to the side is the other original building. 
the church, the school, and the cemetery. Um, these five sites tell a story of resilient people, people who were dedicated, um, people who had passion. Um, and so I encourage you to not forget them um, as we move forward because what remains tells an amazing story. I thank you all for your time this afternoon. <laughs> So we have time for uh, we have time for a few minutes, a few questions for Atari. We just have a couple things. One, yeah, yeah. I was wondering specifically where where was the uh, Iron Books, the one group Iron Books? Were they were Virginia Manor Road or that area? So if you. Um, Kind of in that area, so near the Merkirk, um, see, no, Mark Station um, is a little bit, there's markers there. Uh, I know that one of the kilns, uh, the, there's a plant, not paint plant, that is on the other side of the tracks. Um, and in that complex, there is one iron ore that still stands. So it would have been in different places. What I have learned, and um, oftentimes I'll tell people it's important to talk to community members because they can tell you things. If you travel up and down Merkirk Road, you see lots of bodies of water. And it's interesting where they come from. And so I was talking to a community member, and he was saying, oh, there's this place called Blue Ponds behind Abraham Hall. And I was like, well, how did it come to be? And he was like, well, they were digging for iron there. And when they hit water, it filled up the hole. And so they would move on. So a lot of those little ponds and sh things that just seem a little out of place, like where is this water flowing from, are actually sites where they would have done, dug iron. But yes, the mark station is the best kind of you know, marker that I could give you to where the iron works were. Questions? Yeah. If tobacco uses up the soil, is there something they could use afterwards that they can grow after the tobacco? Um, it, it's really, it really depletes it. It's a nutrient. It's, it, it really thrives on nutrients. Um, so they would have grown other crops, yes, but they would not be able to grow in that particular part of the land. So, like, they may have had, say, for instance, they did 20 acres of tobacco. Maybe they had 60 acres total. Um, they might have grown other things on the other 60 acres, but they would not have needed as many enslaved people. Um, because not only are you growing and nurturing the tobacco plant, right? Like, if you think tobacco is this little green plant, um, you also have to dry it, hang it, and then pack it and get it ready to go to market. So there's multiple different steps, but you would need lots of hands to do that. And not everyone was good at growing tobacco. And from what I understand, it's hard on your hands. Like, just picking and pruning it is not easy. So those people were considered skilled workers who worked there. Yes. Thank you. Uh, can you explain if the tobacco and the soil fertility and all those things are declining, what was get driving the rise of the plantations um, in that last period? Um, I mean, they, was it still tobacco? It wasn't tobacco, so they started growing other crops, lumber, um, being able to cut down trees, but also, if you think about the proximity, so I use, um, let's Use Zachariah Berry's plantation, for example. Uh, it's in Capitol Heights. It's actually in Walkerville Regional Park. Um, they are footsteps away from the, the Capitol. Um, these people are not only planters, but they are politicians, they are legislators. So they need people to go with them and do work. So as they you know, live, up, they're suburbanites. Um, and so there's work that they can do and have their insight people do to help support the city. A lot of people worked in taverns, they cooked for different homes, and people were leased as well. So we have records of people being switched, you know, go work on this plantation for this amount of years and then you come back here. So um, it continued to grow, but there was a push to sell people south. And we have, we found records um, because People knew where they came from. They knew who their former owners were. And so at you know, when everyone's freed, they're writing, I am so and so and I was enslaved at this plantation in Prince George's County, Maryland. I'm looking for my brothers and my sisters, um, or my family members. Do you know where they are? And they're publishing them in African American newspapers. So we know that there's a considerable portion of people who are sold south. Um, to go work in the deep south, Louisiana, sugarcane plantations, and because they had this unique skill set, right? Like indigo, rice, sugar, that's not just something that you can pick. You have to have a skill to actually harvest that. And then one, okay. um, so after reconstruction, like you mentioned like there was a 
extreme growth in the African American population in like the 60s, 70s. Yeah. What was between like Reconstruction um, and then like what was the pop African American population in the It dwindles almost as low as 10%. Um, uh -huh. And they were. African Americans were relegated either to the northern corners of the county or the southern corners of the county. Um, so, North Brentwood is one of the first African American towns established, but you can also find a lot of African Americans in Brandywine, in Croom, in Aquasco. Um, Polly Murray actually spent her summers in Aquasco, fun fact. Um, but yeah, they can see African Americans kind of getting away from the heat. Um, just if they can stay close to their families they can, but we don't have a lot of, um, we have some families that can trace their roots back here prior to slavery, but a lot of the people who live in our county are people who moved here, or they moved to DC and then came back, or they're from the south. Um, so a lot of those families moved away, and there's so much work to do, it's hard to say, like, I think that in the future, I think we'll be able to look for those families and trace them and see where they went, but a lot of them, you know, disappear into D.C. or they dissipate, like, and unfortunately, record keepers did not always take into consideration the importance of writing things down properly, in particular for the African American community. I was telling someone the other day, my father's family's last name is Offord, O-F-F-O-R-D, and there's a census where they completely jack up my great great grandparents' names. And it was just disregard, wrong ages, wrong dates. And if I didn't know what I know, I would say, oh, it's not them, that's another family. But I know what I know, and I know that these are my relatives, so I'm able to say these are my people. But so much of what was written down and consumed was not done well. Yeah. Uh, in reference to the lady's question about the, uh, the back and how the brother was on the soil, I remember as a young boy, I used to go down the country working on this farm in St. Mary's County. And every day I went down there, I noticed that the uh, crops were in a different location every year. So I think we use the system rotation. So it continually grew back all the time, every year, yeah. in different, different places. Yeah, no, that, I think they mastered it later on. But when they first got here, just like thinking about how much they could make, like, let's fill the whole field up with it. Um, and let's grow, and then when the soil will be depleted, because that moving it is actually a result of them learning Like, I think it takes it seven years for their soil to recoup um, from a plot, so you can't, once you've ex you know, expended the soil's life, you have to wait seven years before you can go back and grow tobacco there. So it takes time, um, but that moving it around is probably indicative of them learning, like, we can't continue to grow here every year and to grow into different spaces. And then if you think about agriculture, like sometimes farmers, which they probably didn't know then, um, like they let a season of plants grow and die. Like I live beside a farm in college and I would hate when they let tomatoes rot because we'd have red fruit flies. It would be horrible. But I knew like by the seasons every couple of years, we would get a season when they would let the plants rot so that the soil could absorb the nutrients and then they would have richer soil. So I think they've mastered a lot more, but when they first got here and figured out they could have this amazing crop, they just were zealous. Um, and they had free, you know, they paid for them, but free labor to do it. Our second speaker, who many of you probably know, uh, is Megan Searing Young. Uh, she's the director of the Greenbelt Museum since 2008. Uh, the museum consists of a historic house and exhibit gallery. If you haven't gone to it, it's a great tour. Uh, and it's focused on the history of the New Deal era experimental community, which was established in 1937. In addition to overseeing the operations at the museum, she's curated numerous um, exhibitions, lectured on many aspects of Greenbelt history, and in 2012, co-authored Images of America Greenbelt. She earned her BA in Art History and Women's Studies from John, Johns Hopkins University and an MA in the History of Decorative Arts from the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Institution and Parsons School of Design Program, where she focused on early 20th century design, material culture, and social history. She's a Maryland native and she currently resides in Washington, D.C. with her husband and two daughters. So please welcome Megan, uh, who will be our second speaker today as well. Yeah, so thank you for that talk. 
Um, and thanks also to the Reparations Commission um, for inviting me to speak, and also to the Greenbelt Black History Culture Committee, who's organized this incredible month of activities and um, art and conversations and all of those things. Today I want to share some of what we've learned so far about Black History and Greenbelt. Um, we, um, I want to preface it by saying really that this is a story that's very incomplete. All of the, at the museum we've been, we established an archive of the African American experience in Greenbelt in 2012 on the occasion of Greenbelt's 75th anniversary. Um, and we wanted to do that so that we could really um, indicate and, and make sure everyone knew that we were, this is history that we're trying to go after and uncover. Um, we are tracking down leads all the time, and this work is um, very much ongoing as we gather and throw and do additional research. Uh, and it's not just me doing that research, there are many people here in Greenbelt who are Greenbelt residents um, who do their own research on their own time and are very generously sharing that information. So we often have a dialogue with uh, people in the community who are doing that, that work as well. And then we really need your help to make this work. Um, this talk is not comprehensive, it's not meant to, it's just really meant to give you an idea of some aspects of the African American experience here in Greenbelt, and hopefully that will inspire you to either share your own experiences with us, uh, both good and bad, um, and there's so much more history that we need to uncover. Um, I'll start today with just a little bit of basic information about Greenbelt's um, coming into being, and then I'll move sort of chronologically and share some of what we know so far. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the land pre Greenbelt. We heard a little bit about Prince George's County in our first talk, um, but when the museum was founded originally in 1987, our area of interpretation was strictly 1937 to 1952. This has obviously expanded in both directions chronologically uh, significantly, um, but we have a lot more research to do, um, including, um, these are some topics that we're, that we're currently working on, um, the population of indigenous people here pre-European contact. Um, also the plantations, farms, and families who were here in the 18th and 19th centuries, specifically on the land that would become Greenbelt. Um, we know quite a bit about some of the surrounding areas, and we do know many of their names from certain plats and things that exist, um, often in the, in the Prince George's County Historical Society. Some of those things are very hard to read, and we really need to do more to narrow down the names and find out as much as we can about the people who are living here. Um, we need to do more research on the enslaved who were forced to labor here, um, and we also are looking into um, information that the cemeteries hold, um, especially areas that are thought to be perhaps burial sites of the enslaved. Um, so this is all work that's ongoing. Just to set the stage a little bit for Greenbelt's creation, um, the Great Depression obviously happened as the stock market crashed in 1929. Um, FDR began his first term in 1933, and he began New Deal programs very quickly after that. The black unemployment rate nationally was 50%. Um, Prince George's County at the time was very, very rural, and the county was deeply segregated. We heard a lot about that in the previous talk. Um, the last documented lynching in Maryland, uh, his name was George Armwood, and he was murdered in Somerset County on the Eastern Shore, and that happened in 1933. So just two years before Greenbelt's groundbreaking in 1935. Obviously, it's not close geographically, but just to give you an idea of what Maryland is like during the time. Um, and there were several thriving historically black communities in the area, like Lakeland, Rossville, Mansville, which again, we heard about. So uh, as part of the New Deal, photographers were hired to go out and document um, the, the state of living conditions of people across the country, um, and then bring that back. And then they also were sent out to document how the New Deal um, was helping in to, um, to allevi alleviate some of the suffering. So this was actually titled in the Letter of Congress, A Slum Backyard Water Supply, Washington, D.C., taken by Carl Wyden, who was one of the photographers who was sent out by the Resentment Administration. Um, this is July 1935. So you can see there the really dire living conditions. And this is not that far from where um, the capital is. Here's another scene. Um, this was kind of front yard playground. Obviously, uh, the, the person doing the captions was Roy Stryker, who was in charge of these photographers. And clearly, it's not, you know, it's not a place to be a playground. Um, so these are a, a, another example of dwellings in Washington, D.C. And here's a one-room dwelling of a white family in Washington, D.C. So um, you can see it's better than the conditions that some of the black families were living in, but they made a point that this is a one-room dwelling in the caption. So this is a kitchen, um, bedroom, dining room, and play area. Um, as you can see the little girl in the center there. So Edgar Rexford Guy Tugwell, he was part of FDR's Brain Trust, and he was an agricultural economist. He was the head of the Free Settlement Administration. Um, he was inspired by the garden cities of the UK in the previous term of the century. Those were satellite cities that were built on the outskirts of, um, 
of major cities uh, in an effort to house people more healthfully. Um, he was very controversial. He was a visionary, um, but he would come to the work site in his white suit. And apparently he was very good at alienating people <laughs> if they didn't agree with him. So, um, but, but very passionate about reform and about um, you know, really experimenting. And some of these programs in the New Deal, you know, FDR was interested in just trying lots of different things. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we believe that uh, Tuckle was able to convince Roosevelt uh, to try the experiment with the green towns. Um, the land where Greenbelt was being built, um, this is what it looks like in 1935. You can see how rural that is. There's no beltway, there's no parkway, there's no um, sort of areas for shopping yet. Um, and this is, um, the Greenbelt construction site is sort of in the top middle there. You can probably see where it is. Um, that's Edmonston Road there, that's sort of diagonally across there. So who was living here on this land that would become Greenbelt? Um, these are two photographs, also in the Library of Congress files, that show dwellings that were on this land. We don't know who lived in them. We don't know if they were black or white. Um, we have a lot more research to do as far as that goes. Um, but we know, as I said, that there were families living here. Um, the land was purchased quickly because they had to start the project quickly based on the um, legislation that, had, that was going to create the towns. So um, we know, as I said, we know some other names because of the plots and maps that we have. Um, and so far, we only know of one example of a black landowner, but of course, there are probably more. Um, and if not landowners, then there were people who were working here. William E. and Rachel Jones owned a large area of land that was called Shepherd's Farm that is right on the land that became Greenbelt. Um, they owned that from 1926 to 1933. And unfortunately, they lost the farm tragically to a mortgage foreclosure in 1933, just before Greenbelt um, construction would start. A man, William was his first name, Magruder, purchased the land and he was the one that sold it to the government. So um, that's a story that we need to do a lot more, a lot more on. Here's FDR visiting the site. Um, you can see that's Wallace Richards there, who's one of the administrators. Um, when FDR came out, it was a big event. There were tons and tons of press and um, people taking movie reels and all kinds of things. Um, but he really did give his support to the project, at least at the beginning. So Greenbelt would really be built for three reasons. It was built to put people to work. It was a relief project. You can see that graphic there talks about how Greenbelt Towns created jobs quickly. The RA was very intent on making sure that people were understanding all of the benefits that these communities um, would bring because they were very controversial. Two, relieved a housing shortage in DC. There's a little shot of a, of a house with a furniture room sign. And then three, it really was a model of modern town planning. That's a page from a booklet that the RA produced that shows the sort of chaotic city and then the green, um, carefully planned Greenbelt community there off in the distance. So there were three green towns built, Green Hills, Ohio, Greendale, Wisconsin, and Greenbelt. The fourth that was scheduled to be built in New Jersey was never completed. It was held up in litigation, so they let that one go. So Rossville Rural Development, um, this is the, a part of the land that was purchased to become Greenbelt that was going to be set aside for black families to occupy. It was not laid out in the same way, it did not have all the, would, would not have had all the amenities that Greenbelt does, um, but they did have that plan that part of the land would be set aside for um, families of color to live in. This was wildly controversial and in a state and county that was so deeply segregated, um, the local population here as well as elected officials objected and it was jettisoned pretty early on. Um, we know from some of the early sources of uh, people writing about Greenbelt's planning, um, particularly a book by um, Arnold. Uh, he talks about how the planners sort of indicated that, well, these families had their own housing projects in the city. Langston Terrace Dwellings was one that was built specifically for black residents. Um, but this is one of the, you know, we just need to know more. Um, we know roughly where it was going to be. We know that the name came from um, the historically black community of Rossville. Uh, and we are just trying to find out more about how these decisions were made on the part of the, uh, the Rossville administration. Here's some of the opposition to Rossville. Um, you can see that part I highlighted that one of the main objections was that um, the people here objected to the possibility that some of the houses might go to black families. So um, Senator Sasser was very involved in this fight, um, as were several other people. They also claimed that it would um, disturb the sort of tax base. This community wasn't going to be rebuilt, wasn't going to be taxed in the same way. Um, and it was not built. So, 
here are two of the other New Deal communities that were built um, for black families, Aberdeen Gardens in Newport News, Virginia, and Langston Terrace Dwellings in DC. And just a side note there, the big frog that's on the playground at Langston Terrace was actually done by Lamar Thomas Strauss, who of course did the public art here in Greenbelt. Mm. So this is a document that um, was only found in I think the past five years. Um, I had a student that was doing some of this work and she found this at the National Archives. And it's a survey of colored projects written by Charles S. Duke, who was the founder of the National Technical Association and was an advisor. Um, there were the groups of um, advisors, black advisors who helped Roosevelt try to formulate some of his projects and programs that were aimed at black residents, or black citizens, I should say. And he goes into a fair amount of detail about why um, these projects, there were 30, I think, originally planned. And he says that um, many of them were held up by objections from citizens in the areas where they were going to be built. He also claims that some of these projects did not have the same professional staff that um, the white projects did, projects built for whites, and that that was a problem as well. So who built Greenbelt? Uh, we know that it, the workers were housed in DC and they were brought out here on um, either trains and then put on trucks to go the rest of the distance or um, some of them may have been brought on trucks um, without the train. <laughs> but here you can see there um, on the truck, it's, uh, there's a little sign that says colored line. So they were brought out to the site separately. Here's the white line to get on the trucks and then um, they were sent to work at various places after picking up a badge that either said skilled or unskilled labor. Um, we know that they were teaching new job skills and we know that um, many of the people, uh, they, there were so many people that needed work at the time that the workers were sent out before the plans were completed for Greenbelt. So the very first thing they did was clearing the land to build the lake. And much of that work they did by hand in order to make the work go further. They also sometimes worked them in shifts so that they would spread out and work amongst as many people as they could. We don't know much about who they were, uh, they were, as I said, they were housed in D.C. Um, here are just a of two workers on the job. And we, um, here's more workers down here. In some of these photos of the Library of Congress, you can see that it sort of looks like people are not working, they're sometimes sitting in close proximity. And sometimes on the, in the photos that show the work as well, um, they're often working side by side, black and white laborers. So these are some excerpts, again, from Joseph Arnold, his book, Greenbelt, The New Deal in the Suburbs, is one of the um, best records of the building of the community. And he talks about how conditions were worse for the several hundred Negroes who were housed and fed separately in a warehouse at 12th and End Streets, separately from the white workers. But he says once the project got underway and people were getting work, um, the lodge underwent a renaissance and the men formed their own policing system and lodge council, organized sports teams, purchased equipment, and even put on a vaudeville show. So that was the effect that the work had on um, some of the workers that were there. You know, we, we were often asked, well, aren't there records of who these people were? Aren't there roles or you know, records of payment? And we've not been able to find any. Um, you know, when you consider that even some of the WPA art was destroyed, you know, it's not a surprise that uh, records about laborers on individual projects um, perhaps were not kept. Um, the tide sort of turned and the whole um, WPA, New Deal um, sort of effort uh, fell out of favor, and Tuggle actually resigned before Greenbelt was finished being built, and within a few years, he was the governor of Puerto Rico. So FDR really distanced himself <laughs> from Tuggle. <laughs> um, so here's an artist, uh, Lenore Thomas Strauss, who we have an exhibit about right now. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about her is that it is clear, I mentioned it before, but some of the planners were very progressive and were very interested in building um, communities where the population would be integrated. Um, and she, I think, is good evidence that people working on the project were aware of the conditions and some of the sort of climate of racism that was um, here in Prince George's County. That's a shot of her actually doing the carving on one of the bar leaves that are the preamble on the front of the community center here that was center school. And that's a snapshot that she took of workers. Um, there are several in this series of workers that were working right alongside of her in front of the school building. This is a sort of, um, it's a mock-up for one of the bottom leaves that she submitted to the federal government. Um, she uh, submitted this as um, the illustration for established justice, uh, that line in the preamble. And you can see pretty clearly the kind of statement that she's making. There's a judge and jury turning their backs 
on essentially a lynching scene. There's a man in a hood with a shotgun. So the fact that she wanted to put this, you know, on the front of a school building um, in the late 30s, and you know, she was in her 20s, I think, when she did this, mid 20s. Um, it was a pretty bold statement that she was well aware of um, the climate of racism in the county. It was rejected, <laughs> as you may imagine. <laughs> so that didn't happen. <laughs> so moving on to tenant selection and what we call the mechanisms of exclusion here. So this is another page from the RA booklet that shows the sort of ideal white family, nuclear family that they were looking to populate Greenbelt with. Here is um, the registration form. You would have filled this out before um, being sent to the next level where you would fill out um, a more complete um, application and there's that blank right there that's circled uh, for race. So that's the primary mechanism of exclusion that we can find. You know, some of the people that I've talked to um, over the years, um, you know, have, we don't know people who are living in this area in Greenbelt um, who were black if they understood that this was not going to be something that would benefit them, or if they did apply and then were turned down. Um, we need to do more research about that. Um, there is one letter that actually um, Mark Miller, who's on the Reparations Commission, found that was written to Eleanor Roosevelt um, from a black woman who talked about how living in a place like Greenbelt just seemed like it would be ideal. Um, and I think she was hoping that she could apply. So um, this was, as far as we know, the main way, though, that people were um, excluded. Families of color were excluded. The other thing about Greenbelt is, um, you know, the people that they were looking for, um, despite the fact that it was exclusive to white families, it was integrated in terms of religion. So they were aiming for 63% Protestant, 30% Catholic, and 7% Jewish. And they pretty much stuck to those um, from the beginning. So that in itself is pretty radical and unusual, um, because typically in American cities you would live um, in areas where often you were surrounded by people who practiced the same religion that you did. Um, so it is one thing that they, the sort of progressive people involved in the planning did, um, did were successful in including. And they were looking for people who would be willing to um, form all the committees and, and clubs and organizations that it takes to run a successful community. Um, they wanted people who were interested in living with cooperatives. Um, Rex Tugwell believed that cooperatives were the middle way in between capitalism and socialism. Um, and so they called themselves pioneers, and often um, that refers to the fact that they were pioneers in a new way of living. Um, so, you know, it's, there's so many contradictions here, um, populated with very sort of progressive-minded people, planned by progressive people, but again, um, exclusive to whites only. So when we hear people in the community talking about what Greenbelt was this utopia, you know, we want everyone to understand who comes to the museum that it only would have been utopia for you if you were, if you were allowed in, and you know, it's something to keep in mind. So as of, um, this is from 1939, so really early on there were some conversations about race in the Greenbelt Cooperator, which for those who don't know was the um, volunteer newspaper um, that was begun November 37 and comes out weekly, it's now the um, Greenbelt News Review, and it's never missed an issue. So to be a researcher here, it's pretty incredible that we have the documentation from the Library of Congress, those photographs, and also the News Review, so it's great corroboration when you're trying to figure out what was going on. So this little editorial is about, um, uh, there was a, a gentleman of color who wanted to eat at the lunch counter in town in 1939. And apparently um, there was, uh, people didn't want him to be there, asked him to leave. And this editorial is coming out and saying um, that there's no place for that here at Greenbelt. It's one voice, or the editorial voice of the newspaper, but um, of course there were, it's not true that um, this doesn't represent the thoughts of everyone living here, as you'll see. So as of the 1940 census, that shows three families of color living inside the city limits of Greenbelt. The Joseph and Agnes Younger family, they were closer to Vanceville. The William Jackson family, um, they're the family that we believe owned their land. We need to verify that. And then the Randolph and Marie Gillespie family. But none of these um, people were very involved in the community. According to Arnold, he said they were living sort of on the outskirts of um, the Greenbelt sort of municipal area. We have other records um, that we can learn from as well. This is a draft card for Victor Andrew Randall, who lived in Lakeland, the historically black community, just a stone's throw from here. Um, and yet he worked in Greenbelt. He was a porter in the Greenbelt Project. Um, so this is valuable information. And we know there are connections between Greenbelt and Lakeland. Um, we have evidence of another, um, at least one other person 
who was um, helped um, was a housekeeper for someone here in Greenbelt. And according to the oral history um, that's referencing that situation, the mother, one night the um, woman who was helping her around the house had to work late there because there was a party or something, and the mother was very worried about her getting home safely. Um, so I'll talk about that more later as far as some downtowns go. So then World War II housing um, was added here. A thousand additional homes were added to the original 888. This was in 1941-42. These also were for white families only. Here's a shot showing the defense housing. It was not laid out with the same care that the rest of Greenbelt was, although it did have some features that were um, also seen in the original. And interestingly, many people, um, we've been told, and the oral histories show that people were told this was temporary housing, um, but a researcher here in Greenbelt, Ben Fisher, who's in the back, um, found a document actually that shows that that was not the intent. They were always supposed to be permanent housing. Um, and that begs the question of did the government just let people believe that it was temporary? Because it caused a lot of anxiety that the community was going to double in size without appropriate resources. There were so many school kids um, going to the center school that they had to run them in shifts during World War II. So it was something that people were worried about. So this is a um, thesis, uh, Sociology of a White Color Suburb. And it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It says there are some Negro workers, written in 1944, there are some Negro workers who do mostly janitorial and similar jobs in Greenbelt. They're not allowed to reside in the town. They're at the bottom of the status hierarchy. They're not greeted by housewives, like some of the white service workers. They have the worst jobs, the least pay, and no deference is paid to them. Um, so you know, you can see that um, this, uh, in this account anyway, it's um, even said at the bottom there, even a self-styled quote-unquote liberal said, Negroes wouldn't be happy here, they should have commun communities just like this, but it would do no one any good to mix them here. So he doesn't attribute that quote, but he was here um, in Greenbelt doing research for this, for this thesis, and it's, um, there's a lot of interesting information in it. One of the few people of color who um, comes up again and again, particularly in the news review, is Jerry Gooden who um, we know that he came here to Greenbelt in 1941 as a laborer. He was probably a porter, so you can say a janitor, in the um, downtown area where the shops are. Um, and many people have really clear memories of him. He was a storyteller, and he often had candy in his pockets for the kids. Um, his wife's name was Mamie. And eventually, it seems like he kind of started to live here above the shops. Um, and that's a photo of him with uh, Pop Cipriano, who was a famous, um, Farmer in the area over by Sabrina Square was the name that he owned. And um, I think both of them were honored as citizens of the year that year, or one of them was. Um, and, um, but we, again, need to do more research about him and his life. We've also found that the cooperator references to minstrel shows. Um, that's not unusual to Greenbelt. Country, you know, um, communities all over the country were hosting minstrel shows. Um, it was Unfortunately, uh, just evidence of you know how sort of endemic these sort of Jim Crow notions uh, were, and so here's a reference to um, the high school PTA fathers plan a minstrel show. And through some detective work, we were able to track down a photograph of that minstrel show, and you can see the men over on the left hand side in blackface. Um, the other young men are wearing makeup as well, but don't don't be in full blackface. Um, this was very generously shared by members of the um, Snot, Snotty and Brittingham family. Um, and they told us that this is a photograph that they had in their sort of family you know, records. Uh, and that it's, they didn't perceive that you know, this was, I think how they put it, like they, there was, they didn't perceive this as overt racism. Of course, we know now that it is um, and was. Um, but it was not unusual. You know, there were menstrual shows. I saw them in newspapers for Hyattsville, um, lots of communities in this area. So this is, again, more, more research that we need to do. In 1952, the government sells Greenbelt. And here's a photograph of the signing of the papers. It was originally a group of veterans who organized to purchase it, um, the Greenbelt Veterans Housing Corporation. And then they opened it up to other residents. But again, they would be mostly white. Here are some ads for it. Add some are fun for the whole family, vets and non-vets. You can see the people in the ads are white. Um, and Greenbelt homes would remain white only until 1966. Um, we have some evidence that there may have been staff working there who were sort of gatekeepers, who were, they were the sort of mechanism of exclusion in that era, um, but we don't, you know, we don't have, we've not been able to find in the records of GHI um, mentions of covenants or um, restrictive um, clauses 
as we saw in some of the other redlining examples in the county. We did a program called Mapping Racism in 2018, and the gentleman that spoke was very involved in tracking down this information um, in, the, in this area. Um, and he did some digging as well, wasn't able to find it. That doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> you know, we are, um, we, I would not be surprised if we could find something like that. Um, but it's clear that at this time anyway, um, it was mar being marketed towards white families. Also, um, over the years, you start to see a few more pictures featuring people of color. So this photo is undated by the late 50s um, when Lakewood Homes opened. And you can see it's a race that's about to start. And there are two people of color there and a child off to the side. So there you see a few more images like this as time goes on. And then the Fair Housing Committee, there's a Fair Housing Committee that was very active here in 1963. Um, and they held public information meetings. You can see 200 people attended the first one that they held. Um, and many of these people were very committed to attracting um, people of color to live in the community. They wanted to live in an integrated community. Um, and there were some, however, that attended these meetings who were just worried that if the community integrated that their housing prices would go down. So it was a real mix of people who were interested um, in this in this committee and the work of the committee. But there, um, we do have some oral histories of people that worked really tirelessly to uh, promote fair housing in Greenbelt. And at one point, before the, the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed, the Greenbelt Council asked the apartment owners to voluntarily accept, you know, sort of, um, uh, incorporate fair housing into their um, into their practice. So here's Spring Hill Lake from 63s when that started being built. It was both in phases, and Boxer Village was built in 67. And again, we've not been able to find restrictive covenants in those two places. Um, there are reports of a family living in Boxer Village, a family of color, uh, pretty soon after it opened, and I think they were original owners. Um, so we need to do again more research to track them down. Desegregating Greenbelt Homes Incorporated. So this is Angie and Rivers Williams who moved into Greenbelt Homes in 1966. Um, they ended up moving away in 1971, but they were kind of recruited by some of the people on the Fair Housing Committee to move in here. They had a lot of trouble finding a place to live. They had visited um, many other communities. I think one she mentioned was Kettering. And she um, is trained as a, uh, she's a reverend. And she said that one of the problems was that on the phone, she thinks that she didn't, she sounded more white, that when she showed up for the appointment for when they were gonna show a home, they said, oh no, we don't have any available, or you know, there were all kinds of really, she said, just you know, horrible demeaning experiences. Um, and so when they found out that they could come into Greenbelt, they did so. She talks about it in an interview that we've recorded that's on our YouTube channel, if anybody's interested in seeing that. It's fascinating to hear her talk about it. She said it was a little bit like living in a fishbowl, um, but that she made lifelong friends here that she still stays in touch with. She lives, um, I, think, I think, in Virginia now. So here's a Unicef Drive outside of um, the high store. So we don't know who the girl is there next to Leo Gurton. Um, we need to track her down. We think this is probably the late 50s, maybe 60s. Um, so a lot more work to be done. There are other instances of activism here, University of Maryland students um, and a mule train sponsored by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference stage a protest here. That's at the um, I think that's the AMP that was at uh, Beltsville Plaza. This is May 1968. There was also a Poor People's March that came through Greenbelt, and um, there are accounts of them being allowed to stay, I think they stayed overnight in the community church. So I didn't include that here, but. And then busing, of course, we um, heard a lot about busing in the first talk, our tourist talk. Um, mandated, mandated busing was done to segregate schools in 1972. This is an area we really do want to do more research in. As our tour said, um, many people are living right here who experience busing. Um, I did to some degree. My school was running a tuxedo, and when I entered in the early um, 70s, there were a handful of students of color. By the time I left, six years later, there were a handful of students who were white. So that is how quickly it changed um, in this county. Uh, it was very controversial in Greenbelt. There were many, many articles in the newsroom about it. Um, and it's still, um, it's an area that, uh, I feel like a broken record, but we need to do more research. Um, I've had conversations with people who said that it changed their life positively. Um, and both people of color and, and white students. Uh, and there's some um, interesting comments from teachers that we've received over the years. This was the first person of color to run for Greenbelt City Council, Jeanette Gordy. 
Uh, she was not successful in her attempt, but that was in 1979. And one of the interesting things is, I don't know if you can make out those bullet points, but um, some of the things are relevant, you know, today, so. And then in 2009, after a series of meetings with Fairvote, ACLU, and NAACP, we built a license for a person of color, and then Jordan, who were pleased to have you there. Uh, our current mayor. I saw Danielle here as well. And then, of course, um, Rick Gordon, who tragically passed. Uh, we'll all miss him. So many thanks. Uh, these are some of the people who have helped in this research. Um, Sheila Fetak is my colleague, who was the one that helped track down that photo. Uh, ben Fischler, John Henry Jones, of course, helped with some of this information. Stephen Hopkins, who's here, who's here in the audience, is a researcher, um, as well as um, Sally Stokes, who's passed away, but Alan Berto. These are just some of the people that have helped um, in tracking down this information. Mark Miller is also listed there. So that is a sort of view of the past, I don't know, 70 years? Three bomb, 80, 83, something like that. There. One thing I do just want to say quickly is that, um, you know, it does seem like Greenbelt is a place that I think of often with many contradictions. You know, it was this federal government project that was um, built with these very progressive ideals. He had completely excluded black families. Um, emphasis on cooperation and the sharing of resources, but it functioned for many years as a sundown town. I forgot to mention that in the in the talk, but there's no evidence of signage here, but there are many, many accounts of people of color not wanting to drive through the community after dark and or of um, um, the KKK being here. Oh, there's one famous instance of the KKK where um, uh, a bunch of kids in high school, um, primarily white kids, I think, came through the 60s, and grabbed eggs from the local um, convenience store and egged the KKK members until they ran away. <laughs> so, yeah, and we are always looking. We want more stories, um, as Ortora said, about resistance and um, resilience. And uh, when you look at the photographs of the workers, you know, some of them are coming to work in um, three piece suits with hats, you know, both black and white. And I think that speaks to the dignity of the work that was being done here, um, despite the fact that they wouldn't be able to live in the community. So, um, so please do um, reach out if you have stories or anecdotes or want to share any of your experiences here. We really want to hear them. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Megan? Hi. Um, you know, at the, the beginning, I'm just thinking that Eleanor Roosevelt and Tugwell would not have supported the concept of this being a racial uh, community with, with whites only. Um, what do you know about that interplay? Um, I guess they had to basically, in effect, lobby with Congress that was appropriating the money. So how, how did that, unfortunately, not work out? Yeah, from what we know, the conversations were um, essentially that if, if the federal government really pushed for at least communities to be integrated, that they would be challenged in court. Um, and that was, one of the, that was one of the things they were experiencing at Greenbrook. Um, a judge there found that the whole project was unconstitutional. And so they were more focused, I think, on getting it built. And Tugwell was kind of um, extremely focused on getting the thing built, and that was one of the sacrifices that they made. Yeah, but you're right, El jobs. yeah, and Eleanor Roosevelt would go on to you know, write the um, <laughs> Bill of Human Rights, which includes, I believe it includes housing. Um, but remember, FDR also did not support an anti-lynching bill, because he was trying to keep the support of some of the Southern Democrats. So there's all this nuance that's involved in this. Um, it's not black and white, and, and they were making decisions that we wish they had not made, but you know, for the survival of the project, I think that's how that worked out. Is there a question on the registration form asking for religion? Yeah. There was? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think so, yes. If not on the one I showed, there is one on the um, on the, uh, the longer form. Yes. Have you had a chance to evaluate filled out applicants? I mean, do they have records? No, we don't. We don't, don't, don't have them. Okay. We don't have them. We have some letters welcoming people into the project. 
And we have some oral histories that reference their parents being interviewed. They sent a selection committee to your home. They did a white glove test. They wanted to be sure that the families were educated. Um, the salary range had to be between, I think it was uh, between $800 and $2,200 a year. So they were after a very specific kind of person. But we don't have any of the complete applications. And, and wasn't it also supposed to be a thousand families that worked for the federal government? So, so that that might have been a barrier, also. From yeah, the there's standpoint. there's been some controversy over that, um, or not controversy, just inability to, to determine if that is the case or not. Some things have said yes that some of the articles say that they were going to pull mostly from government workers, but then some of the other um, documents say that they did not want it to specifically be only people who worked for the federal government. But of course, Belt Valley Cultural Center and um, College Park and many people did carpool into the city. By 1939, about um, I think I think 60 percent of the population did have cars here, and they often carpool or things like that. And going back to one thing I didn't mention about people being integrated, one of the things that we've heard from people is that GHI's requirement to have such a large amount of money to put down initially to move in was a barrier mm -hmm. um, because some banks didn't understand the cooperative system. And then, in addition to that, it's sort of, sort of like layers of difficulty. If you were a black family, you were trying to get a loan from a bank that might not have understood how cooperatives work. So lots of things may have, um, you know, may have played a part in that. Um, it's, you know, it's something we, we need to investigate more. I don't want to dominate the question, but I have one more. So in 1981, um, my now husband and I were looking for a house, and he was a vet and had veterans' privileges, and we could not buy into GHI. So I find that an interesting flip. If you yeah. had a slide from the early 60s, yeah. that, or I mean the 50s rather, that it was a veterans group that was buying it, and then by 81, we could and not. You couldn't, yeah, that's it. So I actually, in Boston, outside of Boston, my family lived in the development. It was run control, and it was built after World War II for veterans. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more question, and then we'll move on. So you mentioned that in 1966, GHI integrated. I was wondering about non-white, non-black families, because yeah. I was one of them. Sorry. In 1963, my parents lived in GHI. We were on Ridge Road, and we were here until 1967. So we need your story. <laughs> no, no, I was four years old. Yeah. And we're, my parents were immigrants from India, so non-white, non-black. Yeah, yeah. And, um, my father worked for NASA Goddard. Oh, that's so he was a federal employee. So I was just wondering if there were other Indians, Asians yeah. that were admitted into GHI because were brown, where it's not considered right. one of the other. Right. right. So I was just curious. It is something we've looked at. And um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that um, uh, we've looked in the newspapers and in photographic evidence, and there is a photograph of a series of, I think it's the Navy Wives Hold a Bake Sale, and one of the women is Asian. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's little bits of information that we have, um, and that's certainly something that we'll be able to find out more about as the census from each of those successive um, series comes out. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to find more. But as far as we can tell, there were not very many people, yeah, who were, who were of other backgrounds, yeah, Asian or, or the like, but, but I want your story. <laughs> Um, thank you, Megan. Uh, big round of applause. I wanted to invite Adrian and London to come up. We're just going to give you a brief uh, update on the Reparations Commission, uh, given the history uh, and the recent racial justice movement in the U.S. over the last few years. Uh, there are many citizens in Greenbelt who wanted to have a Reparations Commission. And so what our charge was, was to review, discuss, and make recommendations related to local reparations for African Americans and Native Americans in Greenbelt. <clears throat> when the council set us up a year ago, um, they gave us very little guidance, um, which, so we spent a couple of months kind of figuring out who we were. But I think it was a, kind of a brilliant move because the 21 commissioners are very diverse. Uh, both racially, gender, and regionally, and we have different opinions on the commission. And so we kind of needed to figure out how we can listen to each other, listen to ourselves, and listen to the community, and come up with a cohesive strategy on how we can allow the city of Greenbelt to heal from all the harms that have been caused. 
So what we've done since then is to help us kind of figure out how to work together. We brought in a facilitator who is going to run a retreat and help us identify our common goals and build a strategy on how to achieve those goals. Ultimately, we're going to produce a report for the city council. Um, we've also formed uh, two subcommittees. One is the education subcommittee and the historical research subcommittee. And I'm going to have Adrian give a little update on the historical research subcommittee. Yes, so we have been meeting for several months since it, it, since it started, uh, the Historical Research Committee. Um, we have done quite a bit really to investigate the history of injustices and harms done to African Americans and uh, indigenous people in and around um, Greenville. So that has also fostered some conversations about Prince George's County um, and, and really trying to make sure we understand where. Um, we've met with the Maryland State Archives. Thankfully, we had some connections there and were able to meet with them. Um, and they have provided us some guidance on really how to conduct reparations research. There's quite a bit. Um, we were quite overwhelmed by the amount of research. Um, we've also gathered information from the Greenbelt Museum. We, as a commission, um, also took tours to the Greenbelt Museum just so that we were all acclimated to the history. Um, and so we've heard some of what may have presented um, by going to the museum. So if you haven't, we encourage you to also go. Um, we have also engaged a group of students at the University of Maryland um, to really examine the historical and racial inequities uh, in Greenbelt. So that work is just starting. We're really excited about that partnership. Um, we planned this event, so we're really happy that all of you um, are here. We re really wanted to make sure that we were sharing the information that we were hearing, and we'll continue to do that. Um, so this is one of the first. We had, we've also had a webinar, um, and so we'll continue to make sure that we can share information um, with the community as we have more. And then the, there's a 300 or more, I think it's almost 400 pages now, of research um, that has been spearheaded by Mark Miller, um, who's a part of the commission. He's in the back, but he has done quite a bit of research. Um, and this document really um, is relevant to the historical research of um, African Americans and indigenous people in Greenbelt. So um, we are really working, really excited about what can come out of this um, in hopes that this can be a part of the report. Um, that we offer to City Council. And we have London here to give us an update on the Education Subcommittee. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm London McLeod, and first and foremost, I wanna thank each and every one of you for coming out today. Um, we sincerely appreciate it as we continue to work for progress. Um, I also like to take this time to thank the Mayor, City Council for being here today, for my colleagues from the Reparation Commission, thank you so much. Um, Artura and Megan, a wonderful presentation, and of course the Black History Committee, thank you again. I'm going to give just a brief update on our education committee. We are a group, the group that actually is a subcommittee of the Reparations Commission, and we're very passionate about the education portion of this. So this is really looking and doing a deep dive in understanding where reparations is nationally. Um, right now we are in the progress of contacting um, there are officially 13 reparation commissions all across the country. There's a lot more uh, organizations and committees that are forming. But there are 13, and we are one of the 13 um, officially recognized. And so we're contacting the other 12 commissioners, and we're finding out just the, the interworkings, the structural understanding of how they organize. Um, some of the challenges and obstacles that they're having. Um, for instance, we're currently working with um, San Francisco, which has a pretty well-known, it's one of the uh, reparations commissions that is actually in the media a lot, and we're also working with Evanston, Illinois. Uh, working with these two commissions has helped us um, decide to actually understand some of the legal structures that go into passing reparations, and we're also working with Howard University, um, the Thurgood Marshall Law Center actually did the groundwork for the reparations, um, the legal groundwork for the Evanston, Illinois reparations. So we're working hard with that. And of course, one of our things is also not only to educate the commissioners, um, there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of information out there from podcasts to books to articles and blogs and 
you know, understanding what's opinionated versus what's fact, and us looking at things from um, from scholarly resources based on historical knowledge. So we're doing that as well, and of course, educating the public as well. So. Thank you again for coming out. We sincerely appreciate it and hope you stay engaged. Okay, so to close us out, uh, we are going to be doing a public outreach event where we want to hear from you all, uh, specifically what do you think reparations means in Greenbelt today. Um, so we will be scheduling that. Uh, our meeting, uh, next meeting will be March 19th, it's the Tuesday. Uh, we have a webinar scheduled on Indigenous people on March 18th, so information will be coming out on that. And we have a retreat scheduled on March 9th, where we're going to uh, figure out how to solve all the problems. So, <laughs> uh, you're welcome to join us for all of those events. And uh, again, thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it. Thank you.